Captain to crew, stand by to reverse polarity. A film with a spooky, doom-laden name gave us a look at some humans traveling to a far-off planet, an advanced robot, an intense scientist, his naive daughter, thirsty spacemen, and some fantastic visual effects. No, we're not reviewing a chain of bookstores. It's the 1956 classic, Forbidden Planet. As you can see, we're under no restraint whatsoever. All right, knock that off, Quinn. In the 1950s, a lot of sci-fi films were often barely disguised horror movies. They were often seen as cheap B-movies, and major studios treated them as disposable filler for double bills and drive-ins. They weren't considered prestige pictures in need of huge budgets and big stars. They were often low-budget efforts, often shot so quickly they would make the Olympic 100-meter sprint look slow and ungainly. And, of course, they were often cursed with cheap-looking special effects. In short, all too often, it was not a genre for perfectionists. Here's a film that wasn't cheap looking or cast with inexperienced actors or dashed out in less time than it takes you to lose your phone down the crack between the driver's seat and the center console. Help me, I am stuck. Don't leave me here. The Earth space vessel, the C-57D, a name that rolls off the tongue like Eddie the Eagle wearing climbing crampons, is on a mission to discover what happened to the Earth vessel Bellerophon, which hasn't been heard from in 20 years. Commander, if you set down on this planet, I warn you that I cannot be answerable for the safety of your ship or your crew. Commander J.J. Adams lands the vessel on Altair 4 anyway. Warnings of imminent death? Pfft, they're more like guidelines. On the planet, the commander, along with Doc Ostro, who I really hope is the ship's doctor, and second-in-command, Lieutenant Farman, are met by the super-advanced robot, who's known as Robbie the Robot. You are a robot, aren't you? I am monitored to respond to the name Robbie. You might think Robbie is an obvious name, but he's actually not the first robot built on the planet, only the first successful one. The prototypes did not work out all that well. Ronnie the robot went mad and drove into a lava lake. Rennie the robot took hostages and was taken out by a police sniper. And Rani the robot self-destructed after trying to complete the Times crossword. Three down, eight letters, hot sauce. Robbie takes the three officers to meet the last survivors of the Bellerophon mission, namely the scientist Dr. Morbius, who switches between being a gracious host and a grumpy neighbor throwing his dog's poop over the fence into your swimming pool. Do forgive the ill manners of an old recluse. Everyone else on the Bellerophon had died when they tried to leave the planet, killed by some unknown and unseen force. Dr. Morbius had previously warned them not to leave. Nothing suspicious. Nothing at all. It's Morbin time. My co-workers were torn literally limb from limb. By what? By some devilish thing that never once showed itself. And the Bellerophon? Vaporized. Morbius' daughter, Altera, also known as Alta, is a little naive in the ways of the world. We so terribly wanted to meet a young man, and now three of them at once. Lieutenant Farman thinks he is the man to teach her about this thing called love. But Commander Adams pulls rank. I was only trying to be nice about kissing the lieutenant. Oh? Morbius shows the crew the fantastic underground alien city of the long-dead race, the Krells. And for a few scenes, the exposition feels like it's a university lecture. These devices, self-serviced, self-maintained, have stood exactly as you see them for 2,000 centuries. Here, he also puts on a show with his Technics turntables to display his DJing skills. The important takeaway from this scene is Morbius had enhanced his intellect by using one of the mysterious Krell's brain-boosting machines. I wonder if this has any relevance to the plot. Oh, well, I guess we'll never find out. Adams believes he should take back the Morbiuses with him. Or is that Morbi? I can see that was probably very clever, but I don't seem to understand it. But Morbius Sr. isn't having any of it. Adams needs orders from home. Well, fundamentally, it's a question of crude power. So, how to short circuit the continuum on a five or six parsec level. The ship needs to be pulled apart and reconfigured in order to send a message back to their headquarters so far away. Their engineer, Oscar Goldman, is killed by something. Again, it's unseen. No one's seen nothing, you ain't got witnesses. I'm a stranger in this so-called planet. I was just wondering if, well, if you could tell me where I could, uh, I could get a hold of some of the real stuff. The ship's cook is really, really desperate for Robbie to produce some booze, and in quantity. Like, he's really desperate. <laughs> it's smooth, too. You'd think such a dipsomaniac crewman would be dangerous on a deep space mission. I mean, maybe it's true to life. We don't know how different some sci-fi classics would be with a bit more booze. 
like Haywood Floyd sipping on his fifth gin and tonic, or Darth Vader on a bender. Show me the way to go home. An invisible monster attacks the ship. The crew's weapons have no effect, and then it just stops. Adams and Doc return to Morbius' home to try and use the alien brain boost to get some idea of what the hell's going on. The Doc gets a full whack and things don't go so well. Before he dies, Doc asks Adam to delete his search history. It was purely for medical research, you understand. But he also knows the secret of Altair 4. Monsters from the id. Not them. JJ tries to get Morbius to recognize facts. His enhanced brain has also unleashed a monster controlled by his subconscious. That ultimate machine would instantaneously project solid matter to any point on the planet, in any shape or color they might imagine. For any purpose, Morbius. The monster eventually kills Morbius, which conveniently deals with the monster. And to cut a long story short, Morbius has set the Krull facility to self-destruct and the crew of the ship have to leave with Robbie and Alta. The end. Or is it? No, it's the end. This is a pretty great slice of science fiction, one of the best from the 1950s and also one of the most optimistic in tone. There are no alien invasions, monsters or threats to the entirety of mankind. Though things were pretty dicey for Oscar Goldman. How is it done? Done? Skipper, his body is plastered all over the communications room. They did not rebuild him, they did not have the technology. The story riffs on Shakespeare's play The Tempest, but what most people remember are the fantastic effects, Robbie the Robot and Anne Francis's very short skirts, which were very short for a movie in the 1950s. Forbidden Planet was released at a time when Hollywood was looking for colour and spectacle to counter the effect of television on theatre attendances. Well, you low living contraption, I ought to take a can opener to you. TV was black and white and square, and only cinema could give you widescreen and colour. Forbidden Planet was made in Cinemascope, an anamorphic process where the image had an aspect ratio where the length of the picture was 2.55 times the height of the picture. So, really, really wide. Forbidden Planet was also an early film made with stereo sound for the few theatres that were set up for that. Ah, stereo. Pfft. Who needs two channels of sound? I mean, what on earth could you possibly do with left and right speakers? Forbidden Planet features one of the earliest purely electronically generated soundtracks. Electronic music in an era before widespread availability of synthesizers. The score is so weird it's not even credited as music. With tonalities by B.B. and Lewis Barron, pioneers in electronic music who designed their own sound producing circuits where they were never able to make the same sound twice. Which sounds exactly like my tone deaf mate Dave trying to sing Don't Worry Be Happy on Karaoke Night. Forbidden Planet is a highly influential film, providing a template for a military style crew of a space vessel, a blueprint for robotic creatures, and of course, space ingenue who knows nothing about this thing called love until a thirsty spaceman happens along. You can clearly see Forbidden Planet's influence on shows like Star Trek and Lost in Space. It also gave scriptwriters of various TV shows and movies something to crib from, with almost everybody doing invisible creatures from the mind given form at one point or the other. Forbidden Planet is influential in other, less obvious ways. For instance, Altera has one of the earliest snowballed USB mics that she uses for her true crime podcast, where she tries to piece together how the Bellerophon crew mysteriously died after going against her father's wishes and attempted to leave. So mysterious. Director Fred Wilcox was previously best known for Lassie Come Home, but Forbidden Planet is not a dog. Oscar winner Walter Pidgeon was a fairly big star back in the day, and he would later play the lead role in the original film version of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Anne Francis would later be the first female lead of an action-adventure series as Honey West. And Leslie Nielsen, the noted dramatic leading man, would eventually become known as a character actor before finding his groove in the 1980s as a comedy superstar, appearing on talk shows with his fart machine. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. History does not record whether MGM's sound mixers had to contend with Nielsen's predilection for flatulent humor. Believe me, Commander. <clears throat> that is only a foretaste. <clears throat> Cut. All right, let's go again. Forbidden Planet has some of the very best visuals of any 1950s science fiction. Production design and special effects hold up really well. The whole thing hardly comes to 10 tons. Too often in the 1950s, science fiction scripts would lean into the Jiminy Jeepers Jewelikas territory, but Forbidden Planet has a depth you wouldn't normally expect. The ending is not a massive special effects set piece, but Adam's trying to convince Morbius that the monster was inside of him, which is not a line you'd normally try on your potential future father-in-law. Having monsters from the id was a sort of brave concept to put into a 1950s movie. Despite having written about the id, ego and super ego decades earlier, Sigmund Freud's theories seemed to become a pop culture phenomenon 
on it in the 50s and 60s. Even so, it's presented as an outdated theory. It's an obsolete term, once used to describe the elementary basis of the subconscious mind. I also have some outdated theories about how Glenn Miller was the person who shot J.R. Ewing. What? Forbidden Planet was made on a $2 million budget and brought in just under $3 million worldwide, which at the time was considered slightly profitable. However, it's gone on to be viewed for decades, bringing in new generations of sci-fi fans who would discover this gem on their own. The next attack on your party will be more deadly and general. How do you know? Forbidden Planet is smarter than you'd expect for a film of its time. It's not catering solely to crowds looking for low effort thrills. It can sometimes get bogged down in trying to demonstrate the future to audiences, but that is part of its charm. It's also lacking in something that's become attached to the vast majority of older sci-fi films, ungodly amounts of cheese. Excellent lunch, Doctor. There's a little bit here and there, but here's a film with good actors playing things straight, believing mostly in the situation, solid direction, and the production team is on fire. I mean, it's not literally on fire. They were just doing their jobs exceedingly well. Forbidden Planet is a film that stands out for all the right reasons. Forbidden Planet is, along with films like The Day the Earth Stood Still and War of the Worlds, one of the finest science fiction movies of the 1950s, and is also still enjoyable decades later. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.